This puppet may be scary, but I know of a scarier one. You. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the only show willing to play a AAA video game for 20 plus hours just to prove that an imaginary police force is racist towards some imaginary characters. How about that episode, huh? That was a biggie. Pretty earth-shattering stuff, but it also brought up a bigger issue in gaming. It seems like every day our beloved source of entertainment is constantly being threatened in some way, as extremely aggressive special interest groups and Jack Thompson types crusade to get our our favorite games pulled from the shelves. As a result, we as gamers are constantly having to rise up and defend it. Sometimes we do a great job, other times, eh, we could do better. And that's just against external threats. Consider the gamers themselves. Controversy breeds discussion. Gamers raging at each other on social media about everything from Mass Effect sex scenes to Mario's mental state. <laughs> This game is sexist. No, it's not. He's a sociopath. No, he isn't. Five Nights is awesome. No, it's not. It sucks. You suck and you should go die in a fire. But before you have a knee-jerk reaction to all this and send me a defensive rant on Twit longer, at MattPatGT, by the way, stop and think. We've all heard the phrase, there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? And when it comes to games on the internet, those words have never rang more true. All these controversies sure do toss a bunch of free brand awareness to these games, don't they? Whether it's DOA being too sexy or GTA being too violent, costumes being banned, and games being censored does tend to get them a lot of headlines in the press. And angst in the comments, on Facebook, Twitter, from enraged gamers attacking or defending this, that, or the other game. Regardless of what side they're on, they're spreading awareness of those games. It's the best marketing money can buy, and no one's really even buying it. So what if I told you that this was precisely the point? That that has been the goal the entire time? For the game publisher, it's not about artistic purity or keeping games uncensored, it's about cash. Units sold, the bottom line. What if I told you that by defending these games until you've been blue in the face, you've only been used as a puppet by these game companies? Well, I guarantee you that today's episode will forever have you thinking twice about that angry tweet defending Christie's skimpy DOA costume. As you know, Game Theory's unofficial subtitle is the smartest show in gaming. So, in the interest of maintaining that sexy little moniker, I decided to do what I do best, research. And in the process, I discovered a juicy little story thanks in part to the Sunday Times of London. That's right, I read the Sunday Times of London. Hashtag not so subtle brag. That's like plus a hundred points in being either super cultured or super douchey, right? Maybe both, perhaps? I don't know. Anyway, let me tell you a tale of a small game called Race and Chase. Back in the mid-90s, a tiny company called DMA Design was working on this game about cops and robbers, where players had the chance to play as both in a living, breathing city where all the cars and civilians obeyed the rules. As a criminal, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted, but as a cop, you were responsible for enforcing the rules. The problem with that, though, is it's not that fun. And so half the game was just boring. The guys working on it found that it was a lot more fun to mess with the system as the criminals, to disrupt order, to cause panic and unrest. Little by little, the game moved away from a linear story. Monetary rewards were added to encourage the chaos, and once the single button carjacking feature was added and a few hookers sprinkled in, because that's what you do with hookers, you just sprinkle them in, Race and Chase had evolved into what would eventually become one of the highest selling game franchises in history, Grand Theft Auto. Problem was, this was the 90s. How do you market a game about killing people, stealing cars and using said cars to kill more people. I mean, just to give you some context here, the Sega CD action horror game Night Trap had just gotten pulled from store shelves in response to, get this, a woman wearing a nightgown in a private bathroom. <gasps> How will this affect the children? This was also the era of politicians debating the lifelike realistic violence of the Mortal Kombat series. <laughs> Gotta watch out for that hyper-realistic ketchup blood and those dragon transformations. In fact, the Mortal Kombat combat debate directly led to the formation of the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, otherwise known as the ESRB in the United States. For scenes like this. Finish him. Ah! Scorpion. Ah!
My, how times have changed. So what do you do when you have a hooker-filled car theft simulator on your hands? Well, you go to a man named Max Clifford, back then the most famous publicist the United Kingdom had ever known. Responsible for promoting everyone from the Beatles to O.J. Simpson. He was very good at his job, but his methods were... questionable, at best. He encouraged his clients to lie, cheat, and steal. He did everything from helping cover up the sexuality of multiple soccer players to creating the most famous headline in British tabloid history, Freddie Starr Ate My Hamster, which claimed a UK comedian had literally eaten a live hamster in a sandwich. <laughs> yep. It was a lie, of course, but Freddie Starr suddenly became a household name, and it was here in the mid-90s with Max Clifford that manipulating controversy spread into gaming. Max planted stories in conservative newspapers, plied outspoken political figures, and meticulously planned out exactly how the outrage around Grand Theft Auto's violence would snowball. Through his careful planning, GTA ended up appearing before British Parliament to defend itself, and the rights of video games to feature violent content. So let me reiterate what you just heard, loyal theorists. GTA is the mammoth franchise you know today because the marketing strategy for its first game was to purposely throw itself into the line of fire, get anti-violence groups to rally against it, even run the risk of getting banned, just for shameless headlines. And you know what? It worked. That strategy translated to huge sales for a no-name franchise. And what was formerly known as Race and Chase quickly became a million seller based on its notoriety. Well, the rest then is history. And guess what, Internet? GTA isn't even close to being the only game that's benefited from intentional PR scandals. Around the same time, a game called Carmageddon was released. But rather than emphasizing wins and losses and who placed where, this car game rewarded points for causing as much damage as possible, especially with regards to the crowds of people that just so happened to be strolling around on the racetrack. Okay, so kinda stupid, but obviously a game where you drive around in 3D and the literal object of the game is turning people into a fine mist of blood and eyeballs created a large public outcry. But rather than explaining to everybody that the game was meant to be a humorous experience, Carmageddon was packaged in a purposely inflammatory box. That said, and I quote, Pedestrians are the target as he drives towards and through them at speeds of over 100 miles per hour. The game hit number one on the charts upon its release. And of course, the papers all ran headlines like Sickest video game will be in shops by Christmas and The vicious games that children play. Great headlines, even better way to drive sales. And you know what the kicker was? Once the game finally came out, the British Board of Film Classification, or BBFC, which in this case acted very similarly to the ESRB in the US, they didn't even give it the harshest rating they could have, because it actually wasn't all that bad. And and yet the publishers knowingly rode the wave of public outcry all the way to the bank. Want some more recent examples? How about in 2002 when Acclaim was short on cash and needed to find a clever way to market their new game Shadow Man 2? Well, they hired a company called Frank PR and embarked on one of the most infamous marketing campaigns of all time. In an interview with Kotaku, Frank PR founder Andrew, apparently I didn't name my company after my own name Block, explained that none of their games were getting good reviews, so they had to come up with an idea that would sidestep reviews altogether. So they came up with something they called deadvertising. What is deadvertising? Well, if you guessed that it was helping people offset funeral costs for recently deceased loved ones by paying them to put advertisements for the game on their beloved one's tombstone, well then you'd be absolutely correct. But that wasn't Acclaim's only play with controversy. They tried something equally insane with their extreme racing game Burnout 2 Point of Impact, when they actually offered to reimburse the ticket costs for anyone caught speeding in the UK on the day the game was released. A game company incentivizing people to speed? Of course there was scandal. And yet through it all, Acclaim sat pretty. According to Andrew Block, they literally just did it to drum up some press. They actually planned from the beginning to go back on their word before the game came out. They just wanted headlines for a couple weeks. And there's even more. Acclaim got a pro roller skater to do the incredibly dangerous stunt of hooking onto the back of a car up to 50 miles per hour in front of a speed speed camera to try and jumpstart a craze of imitators for their roller skating game Aggressive Inline. 
Oh, they offered people money to change their name to Turok in honor of Turok 4. Wait, there were four Turok games? And finally, for Virtua Tennis 2, they almost hired trained homing pigeons painted to promote the game to fly in and disrupt Wimbledon live on television. Okay, so that last one is pretty cool. And if you think it's just AAA publishers, think again, Internet. Everyone is playing you for the views and for the sales. Last fall, a game called Hatred from Polish indie developer Destructive Creations made waves across the internet when its debut trailer was so disturbing that it caused the game to be briefly pulled from Steam Greenlight, only to be reinstated with a personal apology from Valve's managing director. The game is sold as a no-frills, honest, apolitical massacre simulator in which you play as a single man who hates everyone and wants to kill them for no other reason than that he wants to. The depictions of violence are so realistic that publications across the internet are calling it one of the worst things they've ever seen. And venturing into the comments for this game's trailer, you see people aggressively defending this game's artistic right to exist. So what do the creators think? Well, Destructive Creations themselves have been pretty candid about the whole affair. In an interview with Polygon, their creative director maintained his game's artistic integrity, but also acknowledges the fact that they kind of depended on the trailer's shock tactics for the extra publicity. Oh, and that he's very happy with the results. Kind of seems like it doesn't matter if you're for it or against it anymore, huh? And here's the thing. These games are just the ones that I was able to find with stories admitting to using controversy to drive sales. Think of all the game controversies that cross your screen every week. How many of those are manufactured? Probably more than you or I like to think. Fans, by going to bat for these games or respectfully speaking out against them, are treated as puppets. Pawns. We fought for years to protect our games against the threat of people like Jack Thompson, special interest groups looking to get our games banned or censored, critics condemning games as entertainment of the lowest common denominator, all of which slowed their transition into a respected artistic medium. We took it upon ourselves to defend this beloved pastime, but as it turns out, many of the game makers didn't really care either way. They just wanted their games to sell. They purposely put those games into the the line of fire just to ensure that we were talking about them, attacking them, defending them, tweeting about them, getting them trending, and that, in turn, prompts news media outlets to cover the story, which in turn prompts more gamer backlash, which in turn just teaches the industry to do it over and over and over again. These franchises have purposely given games and the people who play them a bad name just to sell more copies. They've purposely exploited our passion for these games, this medium, just to get bigger, fatter paychecks. In the end, it's not the games, it's the players who are getting played. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Obviously, we here on Game Theory love doing our research, and that means a lot of reading. Currently, I'm reading Fifty Shades of Grey, because a man has needs, okay? No, but seriously, I've been checking out Batman and Psychology, a dark and stormy night all about why we love a superhero without superpowers. It even explores Batman's own psychosis, stuff like why he fights crime and why he chose an underage kid as a partner. Who knows, you'll probably see some of this stuff show up in a future episode. I got that book, and Fifty Shades, at audible.com, where they have over 180,000 books to choose from. If you're a fan of game theory and want to help support the show, consider going to audible.com slash matpat, M-A-T-P-A-T, and getting yourself a free audiobook. Seriously, a free book, no strings attached, and helping us out in the process? Maybe even getting yourself a free preview of upcoming episodes? What's stopping you? I even included a link for you to click in the description so you have no excuse. So help us out by helping yourself out and do a bit of reading. Stick it to those video game companies using you all the time and pick up a book for a change. Now, if you'll excuse me, Anastasia is entering Christian's love chamber for the first time and oh my is it exciting. So uh, go, leave me alone, click audible.com slash matpat and leave me with my thoughts and my research. It's research, I swear. Purely, purely research.